Yay, we're still here. Welcome to Season 11, Episode 7 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Tuesday the 17th of April, and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and the community. I'm Alan. Joining me this week are the usual suspects, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello, Alan. And Martin. Hello, Martin. Hello, Alan. (sighs) So, what have we been up to this week? (laughs) This and that. Help Can me to out elaborate. Here. Throw me a bone. Okay. Um, I've been buying uh, memory and SSDs for uh, a NUC that I pre-ordered. Oh my gosh, this NUC that's never arriving. Yeah. Well, I've 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 since so it's the Hades Canyon NUC, which is this this new. Um, I don't believe it exists. I don't. I it, don't no, think it does. It, it definitely no, it exists. I've, You've pre-ordered I've it. It's vaporware. Of it. I've seen no. videos of oh, it. Oh really? Yeah. 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 I've seen videos of things that never All arrived the, as well. Um, <laughs> All the tech press have been doing their reviews over the last sort of um, what, couple wait, of Wait, and they didn't send you one? I know, it's a bit much. I, I pre-ordered this about six weeks ago now, so I, I feel like I should be, you know, at the top of the list, but apparently not. So you bought the biggest SSD you can find and the fastest RAM you can find to put in this monster of a computer, I have, right? yeah. I've bought a two terabyte uh, NVMe uh, PCI Express SSD. Surely one terabyte is enough for anyone. Well, it's not because I have one terabyte for my home directory at the moment, and it's eight hundred gigabytes full at the moment. So. You want to you want to delete some snaps? That's what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I got the Samsung uh, nine sixty Pro for that. Um, I found a good deal, so I cashed out some Bitcoin, and then um, the never ending had- pipeline of Bitcoin. Well, it's not never ending, but it's, it, there's been a twenty one point six percent increase this week, so I thought it was a good time to. Right. To, to put it to good use. Uh, but it's been handy because the reviews of these engineering samples and these review units are going around. I was able to zoom in on the pictures and see what memory Intel had been sending, you know, these devices pre-populated with for review. Ah. And there's this HyperX Impact DDR4 3200 SO DIMMs they'll be going out with, which runs which syncs with the NUC, but runs considerably faster than the 2400. So, um, why I, does why does all RAM have ludicrous names? HyperX Impact. It's RAM. It's chips on mm-hmm. a board, and it goes fairly quick, and it stores stuff for a period of time until you turn the power off. I mean, it's what it's mad. Does it light well, this up? This is gamer RAM. You see that, hence the name. I think. Oh right. And, and the black and red aesthetic that <laughs> right. Does Steam run better on Hyper Impact's DDR4 3200 RAM? I doubt it. Right. Good. Uh, but yeah, so I've I've been buying all I've got all my components ready, but I am uh, uh, without the nut. Well, not not moment. quite all your components. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just I just need the thing to put the components in. Mark, save me from this Bitcoin. What have you been up to? <laughs> I met a sloth. Right. Okay. Is that a euphemism or is that uh, actually no, a sloth? No, no, no. A, a, a two-toed sloth. Um, a uh, a friend of mine bought as a as a birthday present for her boyfriend a um a experience where you get to meet and feed a sloth and i went along as photographer wow and yes. uh, what well, I, uh, I don't understand well, is, it's is, a, is it a zoo a, or something well it's not exactly a zoo it's not open to the public it's a, a a place where they um raise and train animals for doing things like film and tv huh. um and they've got this pair of sloths who um uh i think the one we 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 met had been on a few adverts and been used by <laughs> that was a famous sloth yeah oh yeah did it have its um, equity card just took a long time to get it out of its wallet oh yeah <laughs> it's really really funny how slow and lazily they move and it basically just hung there while we fed it bits of avocado well it's, wow there. what a so, hipster seeing having a sloth experience <laughs> seems quite niche does, does, does this friend of yours have like a sloth fetish uh, he's a fan of sloths, but interestingly, right. she had a oh, mortal she, fear of right. sloths. Oh, so yeah, right. um, and, and now she's a bit less scared of them. Wow, that's yeah. a kind of bizarre fear to have. I mean, I can understand fear of spiders because they come into your house, and fear of snakes because you might see them out in the jungle. Fear of sloths. Something about it? their angular movements and the way they look when they're crawling along the ground. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not a fear you're going to worry about too much, I would imagine, no, I'm, I'm until sure you, you can get... outrun a sloth. <laughs> Brilliant. Should we get on with it? Yeah.
Well, it is a bumper fun pack news segment, so let's crack on. Martin, what's first in the news? Well, I found an interesting item in the news this week that the um, original gangster Microsoft Windows file manager, which was WinFile. I know it well. Uh, yeah, well, anyone that's run Windows 3.0 or 3.11, you know, for work groups, that was very popular. Alan's using 90s. it on one of his ThinkPads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that at some point, Fact. I'm sure. Um, it's been open sourced. So this isn't the, the file manager that you find in modern day Windows. Like Explorer Windows 10 or Internet and, yeah, Explorer or whatever. This yeah. is WinFile from the 1990s that apparently was still shipping in Windows NT4. Um, and a Microsoft developer has apparently um, taken that source tree out of the Windows NT4 source code and been maintaining it for his own purposes since 2007 and keeping it up to date with the various Microsoft development toolkits and um, libraries and various changes. And um, somehow or other, he's, he's got approval to open source this. So it was released on GitHub under an MIT license. <laughs> and it, So do we know that, I mean, did he just keep it going because he really likes it or is there like yeah. something special that he made it do? So reading through the README on GitHub, it, it, there's one line in there that gives it away and it says that all the changes made are solely determined by my needs of, and personal use. <laughs> so right. I really approve of this. You know, this is somebody who clearly had a workflow built around WinFile and they've been <laughs> maintaining it for 11 years <laughs> just so they can keep, you know, a way of working that's comfortable and familiar to them. It's wow. funny that, I, I mean, I do, I am now getting flashbacks to various technical support scenarios that I had back in the 90s where I had to help people on Windows 3. And yeah, WinFile was one of those useful mm. utilities. It, it did um, multi-paned view as well, didn't it? Or yes. am I misremembering? You yeah, could have I multiple like yeah. modal windows within yeah. and have like two windows each with a different directory yes. and drag stuff between them. Yeah. It it makes interesting reading as well, the source code. Um you know, I, I wonder will this be of any use to React OS? Huh. Yeah. I guess I now, don't know. now that it's I mean there's always the problem that when when Windows stuff or any proprietary stuff leaks, like not released like this, but leaks inappropriately, um open source developers are always at pains to say don't look at the source code because it taints you once you've looked mm -hmm. at it then you know there's a potential like the sco lawsuit you know you've, mm -hmm. you've looked at that code therefore code that you make in the future could be based on things you learn from that code but this now that it's released under an mit license they can go crazy and maybe they will learn something from that it'd be interesting to see if mm -hmm. the reactos guys you know can rebuild that win file source code and run it on reactos yeah yeah, or, you know, that maybe they learn something about, you know, maybe Wine will learn something about the APIs. Who knows? What, what I find fascinating is this thing landed on GitHub. It was it was um, initially committed by some sort of uh, Windows open source bot that they must use on their GitHub hmm. projects. Mm -hmm. And since then, there's been more than a dozen contributors, you know, submitting <laughs> pull requests and various patches. And last I looked, there was 26 issues have been raised against it. And there's nine outstanding pull requests that are sitting there it waiting to does. be. I bet, you there's, I bet you there's someone who's had a bug since, like, you know, 1993 that's really right. bothered them. And this, yeah. is just, this is finally their chance to fix it. It yeah. does make you wonder if... if github existed or some way for people to collaborate like bear in mind most people didn't have internet when WinFile first came out if if it had been available open source how much different would the code base look mm. now than you know what what would WinFile have turned into uh, if it was open source right from the beginning it's it's bizarre that now now it can be open source now it's complete almost completely useless um it, it it's uh, you know people are now actually contributing to this thing it's bizarre how yeah i know people have a lot of time on their hands and it's an academic research interesting project but yeah, yeah something cool something that i'd like to see is um this week or was it la last week we saw notepad plus plus published as a snap in the mm. snap store so notepad plus notepad plus plus is a popular um windows code editor that's licensed under the GPL and somebody has wrapped that in wine inside a snap. So you can now install notepad plus plus on Linux. And I think it would be fun to do the same with WinFile. Yes. 
<laughs> anyway, yeah, there's a challenge for our listeners. Uh, moving on, uh, I found an interesting article on the New York Times. Um, the head of the National Security and Foreign Policy Commission announced in Iran that Telegram would be blocked for security reasons by the end of April. Now, we talk about Telegram a little bit because we have our own Telegram channel, Ubuntu Podcast.org slash Telegram. Um, and I know some people are vehemently opposed to Telegram. Some people love it. Some people hate it. But the thing that made this article stand out it's titled iran lives on this app and it all talks about telegram and how people use that as their means not just for chat but they share photos they do blogging with it they read the news they share viral videos and there's even an official channel for their supreme leader so it 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 surprised me in a way because i I just see telegram as this chat thing that we you know we talk inane rubbish in most of the time but it I found it interesting that it is the focal point, thanks to all the other things being blocked in that country. Telegram is the focal point. It's um, basically the internet. Right. Mm. It's the internet for many of their, their citizens. And I thought that was, it was fascinating that, you know, it, it's one app becomes a focal point. And it's, it's interesting that they, many of the citizens of that country used to use Viber. And when Viber got bought out and then blocked, they just move on to the next thing. And this really highlighted for me the whole nothing mm-hmm. lives nothing lives forever. So yeah. the the problem that's been in the news recently about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg being in front of um, senators in the US and having to be you know chastised um, for what the platform he developed um, uh, has done made me think again how short-lived some of these things are and actually all you are is a buyout away and a, an ill-formed decision by your ceo or a, a change in the law in one particular country and you're toast you know you're you like as far as iran can said nobody uses viber and I, I don't actually know anyone who uses viber either but i know tons of yeah. people who use telegram but in five years time it could be something else completely so what, what I found interesting about this is that some of those use cases, there was blogging in there. And I was like, blogging? And then I remembered, we, we talked mm. about this two years ago. Telegram have this blogging platform called mm. Telegraph, which is telegraph.ph, which is an anonymous blogging platform. So And that integrates with Telegram client itself. Mm. So you can see how they can actually you know publish sort of long form content and and share it around in that means Mm, without Um, the government you know figuring out who they are and where they are exactly suppressing them and it turns out that um subject sub consequently after announcing that this would be blocked in april uh another uh government organization um added to the reasons for this that telegram is going to be launching their own cryptocurrency and there were concerns that this would undermine the iranian economy um telegram have consequently come forward and said well actually we're not planning to launch this crypto platform in countries that are under un sanctions which um iran is so right yeah this Mm. is kind of um not necessarily an accurate reasoning for why they're going to be blocking this but this is apparently is going to be really disruptive for a iranian internet users yeah i was chatting with uh with one of my colleagues who's from iran because we uh, uh at one point uh about six months ago we started getting a lot of people from iran popping up on our telegram channel randomly and i just sort of had a chat with him to just find out are oh, there are a lot of people in iran using telegram and he was saying like one of the that they it's kind of become the social network there and one of the one of the useful features in the way it works is that um if you want to share media with people through telegram you'll get the message but then if you want to actually view the media you like you trigger the download rather mm-hmm. than video or picture messaging someone where it will push it to you it's like you can just get the fact that you've got a message and then you can wait until you're on wi-fi or something to mm. actually download it cool. where so if the cellular networks aren't so good or data's expensive it's a really good use case for that kind of situation so head over to uh, the new york times article and uh, have a read uh, what's up next mark uh, i was reading an article about um a project called post market os low level so i don't think we've spoken about post market os before have we no nope, i don't know so this is uh this is um an in development um 
Linux based operating system for mobile phones. Basically, I think their stated goal is to give smartphones a 10 year lifetime by providing, you know, ongoing security up well, uh, providing an OS with ongoing security updates over a 10 year period. Um, And at the moment, it looks like they're focusing on a set of phones using particular MediaTek uh, system on chips. Um, And a small group of the developers have been looking at um, what's involved in implementing an open source baseband system, which would run on those system on chips. So there's quite a good a good article sort of looking through the steps involved because there's sort of two big areas to look at. One is the baseband system itself, um, and which is the firmware which talks to the cellular modem, and then there's the bootloader which allows you to load that in the first place, which is also locked down and proprietary on most of these devices. Mm. Um, it's interesting that MediaTek is mentioned as the chipset they're going to be building on here because they've not covered themselves in glory with regards to sort of maintaining a decent security profile for their you know kernel for their devices and what have you hmm yeah uh, um one of the yeah so one of the one of the 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 interesting things is that um the bootloader is already based on an open sourced mot licensed bootloader called little kernel mm-hmm. um but obviously because it's mit licensed they can make modifications and then not release those modifications so a big part of this has been trying to reverse engineer um the the sort of special bits to do with device configuration from the the bootloader and then create an open source version of little kernel with those with that information in um, and also there's uh, there already exists um, an open source baseband system called Osmocom BB, which currently runs on very old Motorola um, like dumb phones from a long time ago. So there's sort of an effort going into getting that running on a media tech development board and then working out how to move on from that to actually get it running on a phone. It's a very interesting project. Yeah. 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 It's, um, and it's a, sort of a, um, an alternative effort to the approach that um, that Librem have taken, whereby um, you know accepting that when the when the cellular modem's on, you don't know what it's doing, but giving the user the option to turn it off, which is the the situation we're at at the moment. This is saying, well, really, what we want to be able to do is make sure that all of the software is open source, which is a big effort because no company wants to help you do that. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, finally, in our last bit of news, this has been all over the place. Martin, tell us something interesting. Well, Microsoft are going to be distributing their own version of Linux. What? I know. Now, this is not like the story from a few years ago where they announced that they were making a distribution based on Debian for top of rack switches and what have you within the Azure data centers. This is a bona fide sort of embedded Linux distro with a custom Linux kernel. It's going to be called Azure Sphere, and it's a a distribution designed for IoT and smart appliances and things of that nature. Right. And okay. it's it's a bunch of things, isn't it? It's yeah. the software that runs on a on what they call an MCU, microcontroller unit, and a cloud backend service and a hardware device. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Okay. So it's uh, it, it's a platform which will link to Azure, hence the mm-hmm. Azure branding. Yeah. Right. So it's quite a clever play, actually, because they're going to be like, uh, you know, giving away the blueprints to their chip designs. So device manufacturers can create these devices and sell to, um, you know, OEMs who are actually going to make things, you know, make consumer devices. But then this is all linked together to the Azure Sphere security service. So for every device that ever goes out there, there is a lifetime subscription to Azure associated with that device. So it's, it's quite a cunning um, way. It is to, a very clever play. It, like all those people out there who are looking to build IoT based solutions, they're looking for something, or they hack together their own like shonky Linux distribution, or they build on something like Yocto, or they build something. And then it gets shipped out the door and then never gets updates. Or it might get mm. updates for a short period of time. And this is seeking to solve that problem with right. you know, a, a reference hardware platform, the software that runs on it, and the software in the cloud to deliver the updates. Yes. 
It sounds familiar. It does. Other, <laughs> other, other IoT-focused uh, Linux distributions are available. They certainly are. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have to keep watching this one. Um, but that's the end of the news. Now we have the biggest pile of community news you've ever seen. <laughs> Kick it off, Martin. Right. So Simon Quigley posted to the Ubuntu release mailing list asking uh, to reevaluate Ubuntu's milestones. Uh, this has now become affectionately known as the Quigley proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That sounds and, like a um, film. It, it, in essence, it boils down to a couple of things, and that's that the Ubuntu flavors. Uh, choose to opt in to like the alpha one alpha two beta one releases whereas ubuntu proper just does a final beta and release candidates so it's it's asking flavors should we change the way we do things to be more in line with ubuntu proper to drop those alphas and the early betas and instead replace those with testing weeks where all of the flavors can work together to promote that this is a week where we're asking people to come and download daily images and test them and tell us what works and what doesn't rather than coalesce around because not many people install or test the alphas and the betas and it it needs refreshing and one of the proposals that's come out of this is that um, ubuntu proper has um, existing automated testing for some of the things that the flavors are manually testing right now, mm -hmm. like how the the installer works and does it do the right thing. So um, it's possible that the flavors may get to reuse that existing automation to test the flavors. So instead of having to reproduce manually a lot of, you know, boring testing, we can focus on what our flavors do and the new features and look and feel in those rather than, you know, re all retesting the installer a dozen times each each cycle. So everyone's uh, plus one on this. I yeah, think. I think so. I think I've seen comments from all of the flavor leads to say yes, they think this is a good idea. So uh, I think this is going to go forwards, and I'm sure that the foundations team will be pleased about this because it will reduce their workload as well. Mm. Excellent. Uh, up next, uh, Didier Roche from the desktop team has blogged about snapping the community theme. Uh, the community theme you may remember we've talked about in the past is uh, uh, an activity that's involved a bunch of people in the community creating a new theme for Ubuntu. Uh, and it isn't, the theme isn't ready to ship by default in 1804. But uh, what Didier has proposed and has done is create a snap of the theme. And this has been challenging because uh, I don't think anyone has tried making themes in a snap and mm, yeah. figuring out where all the sharp edges are and how you actually go about delivering that theme and how you hook it up to the desktop so it all, you know, it is found by the 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 um, the desktop environment, yeah, um, and the applications and all that kind of stuff. And he's written a lengthy blog post about how that came to be and how he did it and all the different channels. So you can either sit on the stable channel or you can get the daily updates. So as it progresses through the, the next life, the, the life cycle of the next release, 1810, you can keep getting that fire hose of updates or you can just have the, the stable version or you can switch between them. So that's pretty cool. Cool. Is this only relevant to gnome shell users or will it also do theming on other it environments? work generally speaking on most gtk3 based um mm -hmm. desktop environments each each of the desktop environments have their own little nuances and style classes which would be special case and you yeah. know this may not pick up but there's no reason why you know the um the desktop themers can't add that to fully support all of those but by and large it should work on things like um mate and um budgie um mm -hmm. and gnome and unity seven. awesome cool what's next one uh the ubuntu weekly newsletter is back with issue 523 yeah so this was uh, a community initiative that's been running for well many weeks over yes. 500 and and uh various people have stepped down and moved on to other parts of the project and it's been picked up again yes yeah that's Excellent. great to see it return Yes. So if you're interested in contributing, you can find the Ubuntu Weekly newsletter on the Ubuntu Wiki and uh, you could contribute news for next week's cycle, perhaps. Yep. I've seen some people requesting to join the team recently as well. Yes, so, I noticed that as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's Brilliant. good. Brilliant. What's next? Uh, well, next up is uh, by way of an apology to uh, Chris Lamb, the uh, DPL. So um, Debian 10 Buster is scheduled for release in mid-2019. I may have indicated in an earlier podcast this season that it, it was about 18 months away. And he called me out in our Telegram channel. And sure enough, there's been a post uh, on the Debian mailing list about uh, Buster being released. Should be out mid-2019 with... Uh, the freezes starting in January, um, going through February, and a full freeze in March. Um, and there's some information in there about what they're going to be focusing on in subsequent releases. And we also know now that Debian 11 is going to be called Bullseye, and Debian 12 will be called Bookworm. Buster's the dog, right? Yeah. Yeah. Bullseye's the horse. Yeah. Yes. And Bookworm is that Bookworm rather even from Bookworm. Toy Story 3. Yeah who has the instruction pamphlets to all of the toys' instructions and knows how to reset them. And Oh, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. I, I enjoy that more than anything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Got to love a good naming convention. Yes. Uh, speaking of releases, Ubuntu Studio plans a reboot for the 1810 release. So Ubuntu Studio, one of the flavors that's been around for many years and um, hasn't seen a lot of love because people have moved on from the project to other things. Uh, it's had a bit of a... Um, uh, a bit more love in the last couple of months, getting ready for a new release in the 1810 cycle with yeah. uh, updated applications, all the usual stuff, maybe a theme update or, and yeah, other changes. If, if you've been listening to Linux podcasts for some years, you may remember the name Eric Eckmeyer, uh, who was involved in Jupiter Broadcasting some years ago, and he's been... Uh, one of the people who's been uh, banging the drum and, and sort of uh, drumming up enthusiasm to sort of uh, handle this reboot. So it'll be interesting to see um, see what comes in 1810. Mm. Um, yeah, they, they, they pinged me and were asking about Ubuntu Mate Welcome. So you may see that revamped and, and used in another flavor to, uh, you know, distribute their bundles of software for their very audio and video requirements. Awesome source. Well, we're about out of time for community news, but we've got one event we need to mention, which is what, Martin? It's UbuCon Europe. Uh, it's taking place on the 27th to the 29th of April in uh, Gijon uh, in Asturias, Spain. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Marcos. <laughs> um, and uh, I will be there and many other people from the Ubuntu community, not just from Europe, but from all over the world, will be there giving talks and having social events. Excellent. Mmm, that gooey love. If there's an app that you've been using that you just have to tell everyone about, email your gooey love to show at ubuntupodcast.org. And that's all for episode seven. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. It's been... Oh, that went so fast. Um, yeah. It did. <laughs> I think we're going to come up a little short this week. Um, no, I think we're on time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we could, you know, pad this out with a bit of chatter. So, um, next week, uh, we're going to be interviewing David Britton from the Ubuntu server team. Um, we figured it would be a good idea to interview someone from the server team, mainly because we tend to focus on desktop stuff and, you know, we talk about desktops and Raspberry Pis and all that kind of stuff, but we don't really talk about server stuff. And with the. Apparently, we're big at that as well. Yeah, apparently, we're, yeah, big on the cloud. Um, uh, <laughs> We, uh, we've got a new release coming out next week, obviously, with 1804. And so we thought we'd ask David to come on and uh, talk about what's new. So, um, yeah, you can look forward to that. We'll also have some uh, command line love. I think Martin's come up with a belter of a command line <laughs> love. Killer. So, yes, it is. And we've got lots of feedback as well. Oh, crikey. It's going to be a bumper one next week, is it? Yes. Oh, oh. crikey. Thanks so, a bit, folk, for their non no non no nonsense VPS hosting. That as well. I, I might say that right next time. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>